I wouldn't waste any time building up what we're gonna explore. It's abundantly clear that in this video, we'll explore the entire life of Kong through 22 pieces of work, which include movies, comics, animated and live action shows, starting from the 1933 OG film to the latest Godzilla X Kong. We'll dive into just everything that ever featured our gentle giant. So let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. King Kong, 1933. On a cold, wintry night in the Big Apple, Charles Weston, a guy on the hunt for some adventure and a job, snoops around the docks and stumbles upon this ship called the Venture. He's curious if it's the one heading out for a movie shoot. A dock worker tells him, yeah, that's the one, but also tells Weston that the crew was thinking their boss, Carl Denham, might have lost his marbles. You see, Denham has been acting all secretive. He loaded the ship with an arsenal and more hands on deck than you'd need for the entire cast of Game of Thrones. Weston gets caught chatting by the first mate, Jack Driscoll who's a bit wary at first, but lets him board when he learns Weston's part of the movie biz. Inside, Denham was hashing out with Captain Engelhorn the need to hit the high seas pronto, to dodge any nosy officials that might get wind of their, well, let's say, unconventional cargo. Now, most interestingly, Denham reveals they're missing a key ingredient, a leading lady. Needless to say, it was more of a Mission Impossible scenario because no name was gonna sign up for a mystery tour on such short notice. But Denham was determined. He believes every film needs a bit of romance to hit it big, Oh, and romance he would get, just not in the way he imagined. So, off Denham goes into the night, hell-bent on finding his star. His search takes him to a woman's shelter, but no luck. Then, fate steps in. At a fruit stand, he spots a blonde beauty, and Darrow, trying to steal an apple. The vendor was about to make a scene, but Denham played the hero, smooths things over with a buck, and rescues Anne. After treating her to a meal and hearing her sob story, out of work, no family to speak of, he pitches the adventure of a lifetime to her. Anne was skeptical, but sees Denham as a big shot director. Thrilled at the opportunity, Anne agrees, and they set sail. At dawn, as the ship slices through the ocean, we see some drama between the likes of Anne, Charlie the Cook, Jack, and Denham, but there's no need to get into the details. Switching scenes to the bridge, Denham and Denglehorn are charting courses, and Denham pulls out a map to Skull Island, an off-the-grid island according to a tale from a Norwegian sailor. Now, this island has got all the makings of an adventure, a giant wall, a village, and a skull-shaped mountain. Mm. As they get closer to the island, Denham starts getting all hyped about uncovering the truth behind Kong, a name Engelhorn reckons is local law for a deity or spirit. Cue to Denham, camera in hand, directing Anne to act out a scene of sheer terror on deck, which leaves Jack and Engelhorn scratching their heads. What on earth is Denham expecting Anne to see? As the venture edges closer to Skull Island, a thick fog blankets the surrounding, but when it lifts, we get to see the Skull Island in all its eerie glory, just like Denham's treasure map promised. Denham's pumped to explore and decides to bring a crew ashore, including Anne, who's eager to join despite Jack's protests. The party comes ashore and soon stumbles upon the locals who were in the middle of a ceremony. They were chanting Kong while dancing around a dual-decked woman. Denham can't resist and starts rolling film until the chief spots them. Engelhorn tries to pacify the situation, but the chief spots Anne, the golden woman. He even tries to strike a deal for her, which Engelhorn swiftly shuts down. With the atmosphere turning from tense to hostile, Denham decides it's time to bounce and promises to return for a peace offering. On the ship that night, Jack and Anne have a moment on deck, opening up about their fears from the day. Jack goes all in, confessing his love for Anne. In fact, they seal it with a kiss. But romance on the high seas is seldom smooth. A native sneaks aboard and kidnaps Anne, leaving only a bracelet behind as a clue. Charlie, the cook, raises the alarm, and suddenly it's all hands on deck. The crew realizes Anne's been snatched by the islanders. Without skipping a beat, they gear up and head back to the island, ready to face whatever comes to rescue Anne. So, Anne's caught up in the very ritual she saw earlier. But this time, she was the star of the show. In the limelight, the center of attraction, uh, whatever you want to call it. The locals tie her up outside this massive jungle gate and hightail it back behind their wall. Enter Kong, the main event. A whopping 50-foot gorilla who takes one look at Anne and decides she's coming with him. The rescue squad, i.e. the Denim and Company, arrives just in time through the gate and busts it open before following Kong. Of course, the tribal chief is none too pleased. Not long into their jungle jog, they bump into a stegosaurus. Denim lobs a gas bomb, sending the dino down for a sec. A shock rings out in an attempt to end it. But that just ticks off the dinosaur even more.
more. After a bit more of a scuffle, Denim lands a shot in its eye, and they scoot past the beast, giving it wide berth as it shows signs of life. The crew then arrives at a swamp and spots Kong. They cobble together a raft to follow, but get surprised by a brontosaurus. It wrecks the raft and snacks on a few of the guys. Denim, Jack, and a couple of others manage to dodge it on land, continuing their pursuit of Kong. As they trek on, they find a log bridge Kong has crossed, but the big guy's not done. He doubles back. As they try to cross, Kong gives them a bit of a shake-up, literally. He twists the log, sending folks flying. Jack tucks it into a crevice in the cliff face. Kong, miffed by a stab from Jack's knife, gets distracted by Anne's scream and pivots to check on her. So, Kong is back where he left Anne, and apart from being held captive by a giant ape, she also has to worry about a dinosaur who wants to make her its next meal. Kong's like, not on my watch, and dives into a brawl with the beast. Kong has the moves, but he's the David to this Goliath. In the scuffle, Anne ends up under a tree, but Kong manages to flip the dino, give it a beat down, and rips the dinosaur's jaws apart. That's a uh, jaw dropping. <laughs> Kong then scoops up Anne and heads home to Skull Mountain. Meanwhile, Jack was on the other side of a chasm, watching Denim beat feet back to the village for reinforcements. He catches a glimpse of Kong's handiwork with the dino, and then trails Kong and Anne into Skull Mountain. Inside, Kong sets Anne down, but they're not alone for long. As Kong tries to get a little too cozy with Anne on a cliff, a pteranodon swoops in and eyes Anne. Kong wrestles the flying dino, which gives Jack the perfect shot to make an escape with Anne down a vine. When the couple return, it's revealed that Denim has a plan bigger than Kong himself. Well, the director wants to capture the big ape with his gas bombs. Despite Jack's doubts, Denim is convinced Kong will follow them. <laughs> and boy, does he. Kong, driven by rage and love, busts through the village gate to unite with Anne. Kong goes on a tear. But just when it looks like Kong's invincible, Denim plays his ace and knocks Kong down. Kong, the eighth wonder of the world, he calls the downed ape and envisions a fortune made off the giant's fame. And just like that, they begin to haul Kong back to the Big Apple, clueless to the chaos that awaits. So, Jack and Anna set to tie the knot, and in the backstage, we have Denim's big reveal. Needless to say, the press is buzzing, snapping pics, and firing off questions left and right. And there's Kong, all chained up and kept on a stage. But the camera flashes tick off the big guy. He falsely believes that they were gunning for Anne, so he busts out, leaving chaos in his wake. Next thing you know, he starts tearing up Times Square like a nuke in a crowded city. Jack and Anne rush into a hotel, but Kong was on a mission. He plucks some random woman out, thinking it's Anne, but drops her when he realizes she was not his beauty. However, he soon finds the real Anne, swats Jack aside, and off he goes with Anne in his hand. In the end, Kong climbs atop the Empire State Building, but gets gunned down by biplanes. So, was it the guns that killed the beast, or was it beauty that killed the beast? King Kong vs. Godzilla, 1962. So, the Arctic was basically turning into a hot tub and everyone was scratching their heads. The UN was like, hmm, let's get to the bottom of this, and they sent a team of scientists to find out what it was. Meanwhile, this show, World Wonder Series, sponsored by Pacific Pharmaceutical, is kind of bombing in the ratings, and Mr. Taco, the guy running it, is desperate for a ratings boost. Also, there's Dr. Makioka, who's just back from Faro Island with these red berries and stories of a massive demon god the locals rave about. When Taco hears this, all he can think about is making this god his next big thing. So he sends Osamu Sakurai and Kinsaburo Furu off on a wild goose chase to find this mythical beast. Cut to Godzilla, who's been in an iceberg for quite a while now, and it was Big G causing all the ice melting. The UN submarine bumps into him, which wakes up the big guy, and he's not in a good mood. Godzilla goes on a rampage. Of course, he leaves destruction in his wake and heads for Japan, because, well, Godzilla is a Japanese IP. This throws Taco for a loop because Godzilla's stealing all the media spotlight. Back on Faroe Island, things get a little dicey when a giant octopus attacks. But then, King Kong steps in, ready to rumble. He sends the octopus packing and, like any hero, celebrates with a drink, some of that red berry juice, which knocks him right out. The natives throw a bash while he's still out, and Sakurai and Furu use this window to tie Kong to a raft and start their voyage back to Japan. Well, they kinda shouldn't, but maybe they didn't see the first Godzilla movie. We can't really blame them now can we? Back home, Taco Sho and Kong get all the attention, which overshadows Godzilla. As the buzz grows about which of these titans would win in a fight, Taco can't help but fan the flames. So, Mr. Taco hops on the Taian Maru to see Kong, but the Japanese self-defense forces wouldn't allow it. They instead flag Kong as a no-go for Japan's safety. Meanwhile, Godzilla sinks Fujita's ride, the Shinsei Maru number 2. Of course, Fumiko can't help but freak out. 
and she tries to find her man Fujita, who's already skipped town. On the other hand, Godzilla moves in the direction of Tokyo, but doesn't forget to trash everything in his path. On the ocean, Kong starts to shake off his berry juice hangover, and the crew begins to get nervous. Sakurai and Furu are ready to blow Kong into next week to keep the ship safe, but Tako was super against it. In the chaos, Tako accidentally hits the detonator, but it's a dud. Plan B, shoot the dynamite. <laughs> but guess what? Kong just shakes it off and swims for Japan, itching for a fight with Godzilla. Kong lands and marches toward Godzilla. They meet up, and Kong starts lobbing boulders while Godzilla spits atomic fire. However, Kong soon chooses to back off. The JSDF tries to stop Godzilla with fire, and pits filled with bombs, but Big G isn't really bothered by any of it. Then they set up this electric fence that zaps Godzilla, but ends up juicing Kong up. Kong then snatches Fumiko and goes king of the hill on the National Diet Building. The JSDF plays Kong's lullaby with some red berry gas, and down he goes saving Fumiko. The plan was to fly Kong to Mount Fuji to duke it out with Godzilla, hoping they'd just wipe each other out. In the end, Kong and Godzilla take the fight to the ocean, with only Kong returning. The King Kong Show TV 1966 Back in the swinging 60s, King Kong got a groovy animated makeover in the form of this show called The King Kong Show. This collab between American and Japanese studios was a big deal because it was the first time an anime series was created in Japan for an American outfit. In this cartoon, Kong ditches his city-stomping habits and becomes a big-hearted hero. He bonds with the Bond family to go on wild adventures and battles everything from giant creatures and rogue robots to aliens and nutty scientists. Basically, Kong turns into the ultimate good guy and saves the day one adventure at a time. Thanks to the show's popularity, Rankin Bass passed the Kong baton to Toho, which led to a couple of movies, namely Ebira, Horror of the Deep, and King Kong Escapes. As far as the show's concerned, Kong saves the youngest Bond son, Bobby, from being eaten by a T-Rex. From that moment onwards, Kong becomes a pal to the Bond family. Nothing really interesting here, so uh, let's move on to the next entry. King Kong Escapes, 1967. So, the Explorer Submarine's crew, led by the Carl Nelson, were in the Java Sea. Now, they happen to know about Kong, who's rumoured to be in the area. They've got pics and stories of huge stairs and tunnels on Mondo Island that supposedly are Kong's handiwork. Susan, the ship's nurse, is curious but bummed that they can't visit the said place because of their mission. Meanwhile, Doctor Who was showing off his new toy, Mechani Kong, to his partner in crime, Madame Piranha. His robot can mine a super rare Element X thanks to its radiation-proof design, but when they put Mechanic Kong to work, it fizzles out because of the radiation. Doctor Who gets back to the drawing board, back to the good guys. An unexpected detour brings the explorer near Mondo Island, which gets Susan all excited since she wanted to see if Kong was real. They arrive at the island in a hover car and bump into an old native who warns them against going any further. Nelson and Nomura go exploring and leave Susan behind, who soon finds herself face to face with God of Sordus. Kong shows up, totally smitten with Susan. Say what you will, apart from the monster versus Kong, all the other Kongs have been a bit of a pervert. Anyway, he defends her and goes on to show off with a good old chest beat. But as they're about to leave, Gorosaurus bites Kong, but our hero breaks the dinosaur's jaws. Mm. As they try to escape, a sea serpent tries to snack on them, but Kong dives in for round two, which gives the humans enough time to escape back to the explorer. Kong, still hooked on Susan, follows them and starts messing with the sub. Such an attention seeker. Anyway, Susan tries to calm the big guy down. Kong understood that he was deep in the friend zone, but still concerned, he gently places her back on the sub before they make their underwater getaway. Nelson arrives at the UN building in NYC with the news that Mondo Island had Kong and a group of other prehistoric beasts. Madame Piranha, undercover as a journalist, tries to learn why Kong had a thing for Susan. Nelson's like, it's a guy meets girl thing, and wraps up, but is it that simple? Piranha lets Doctor Who know about Kong's whereabouts and how he's on Mondo. She also tells him that Susan might just be the key to catching him. Doctor Who, thrilled, jets off with his chopper squad to snatch Kong. They gas Kong into a nap and airlift him to Doctor Who's frosty lair. The explorer's crew lands on Mondo, only to find it trashed. They find a native man on his last leg who reveals about a helicopter squad's Kong napping before dying. Putting two and two together, Nelson's like, it's gotta be Doctor Who. Next, Nelson, Omura, and Susan end up as guests at Doctor Who's icebox. Doctor Who has Kong on a mind leash, trying to make him mine Element X. But Kong is not someone you could just boss around, so he rips off the mind control gear and starts a jailbreak. Back with Nelson and company, they were in a literal ice cell. Doctor Who tries to play mind games with Nelson over a game of chess, but Nelson is not stupid. Meanwhile, Kong smashes through barriers to free himself. I'm not entirely sure why, but Doctor Who was making threats when Kong busts out and this leaves a key behind for others to free themselves. Susan and Nomura grab the key and escape. 
Out of nowhere, Madame Piranha shows up, not as hostile as expected, and reunites them with Nelson. Doctor Who, on the other hand, brings around the Makani Kong for a Kong chase, but Kong was already swimming toward freedom. Piranha concedes to Nelson and his friends that she regrets her choices and Doctor Who's extremism. Madame Piranha busts Nelson and people out and gets them to a raft as they dip out, but then she gets taken by Doctor Who's goons and is kept on a tight leash. Kong arrives in Tokyo like a wave, causes a major stir. Meanwhile, Nelson tries to cool the jets of the local defense force, asking them to lay off Kong, but they don't want to listen, because they're scared and worried shitless. Anyway, Susan and Nomura are on the ground, trying to keep things chill, especially with the lights that rile Kong up. Susan ends up in Kong's palm again, but then Mechanic Kong arrives at ground zero. Needless to say, Kong was more than ready to give Mechanic Kong a piece of his mind, even with Susan's warning about Mechanic Kong being a bucket of bolts. The two giants slug it out, but Mechanic Kong snatches Susan and hits the Tokyo Tower. Kong climbs after them, even as Doctor Who tries tries to play Puppet Master over the loudspeakers, but Kong's love for Susan is stronger than any threat, and he saves her from a high altitude drop. Back in Doctor Who's floating fortress of doom, Madame Piranha does one last act of defiance as she wreaks Mechanic Kong's remote. Doctor Who, in a fit of rage, ends her. With its strings cut, Mechanic Kong falls off Tokyo Tower and goes kaboom on impact. By dawn, Doctor Who was trying to make a break for it, but Nelson, Nomura, Susan, and the JSDF were hurt on Kong's heels, as they suspected that Kong would lead them to Doctor Who, and that's exactly what happen. Kong, in a fit of rage, turns the ship into scrap metal and sends Doctor Who to his watery grave. With Doctor Who out of the picture, Kong moves back to Mondo Island. King Kong, 1976. In the movie, Red Wilson, a high-end executive at Petrox Oil, decides to visit a mysterious island hidden under a blanket of fog in the Indian Ocean. Why? Well, no, it's uh, not really adventure tourism, but our guy believes that the said island is sitting on a gold mine of oil. The Petrox explorer ship is about to set sail, but we've got ourselves another player in the form of Mr. Jack Prescott, a paleontologist with a passion for primates and a bit of a rebel streak, who sneaks on board after bribing one of the guards. His sole intention was to check out the island island for himself. Initially pegged as a spy and locked up, Prescott's true identity as a primate paleontologist is quickly revealed thanks to the rescue of a castaway named Duan, who was Duan. She was an aspiring actress whose ship mysteriously exploded. Wilson had to get Duan on board on grounds of humanity. So anyway, with Duan on board and Prescott now serving as the expedition's photographer, the explorer and its crew waste no time to hit the high seas. They eventually find the island they'd been looking for. Now this place, from the outlook itself, was covered in several thick layers of mystery and fog. The landing party, including Duan, stumbles upon an enormous wall that Prescott figures is hiding a tribe, and more importantly, Kong, a massive ape that's more legend than reality. Despite Wilson's dreams of oil riches, the wall and what's behind it suggest there's more to this island than meets the eye. When the island's natives see Duan, they know that she's the perfect offering to their god, who, as you've rightly guessed, was Kong. Later that night, Duan gets kidnapped and is offered up to Kong, who takes a liking to her and casts her off into the jungle. Is the rest of the crew mounts a rescue, Wilson's dreams of oil glory crumble. It turns out the oil's a bust, not ready for another few millennia. But ever the opportunist, Wilson now has a new plan and objective. Well, he wants to capture Kong and turn him into the ultimate marketing stunt back in the States. So Kong snatches Duan and basically gives her enough signs that he doesn't wish to kill her and is super against the mindless killing business unless you're a bad guy. And Duan was a beautiful girl. So Kong was anyway smitten by her. They have a bit of a moment and Kong gives Duan a natural waterfall shower to clean up the mud. Maybe that's the Skull Island version of a spa. Mm. Meanwhile, Prescott and his men were trying to reach Kong. They were, in fact, trying to cross a chasm on a log when Kong tossed everyone but Prescott and Bowen into the abyss. Prescott tells Bowen to head back while he keeps on Kong's trail. Back with Kong and Duan, who's getting a bit too comfortable with Duan until a massive snake arrived to hunt Duan. Kong wrestles the snake to save Duan, but gets all riled up when he spots Prescott. After a tussle, Kong takes down the snake once and for all, but this allows Jack and Duan to make a run for it. Back in the village, Wilson came up with a simple chloroform plan to knock Kong out cold, and it worked like a charm. The foreigners then pack Kong into the ship's hold, heading for New York, with Duan and Prescott feeling all sorts of ways about Kong's predicament. Once in New York, Kong set up for a show, but the flashbulbs and crowds get to him. We'd seen this previously as well. He breaks free, chasing Duan and Prescott across the city. They think they've lost him by ducking into a bar, but Kong's love radar is on point. He finds them, scoops up Duan, and heads for the World Trade Center. Empire State Building says, Prescott contacts the mayor and suggests they let Kong climb the towers to catch him safely. As Prescott gets on the phone, Kong makes his way up with Duan, setting the stage for a high-rise super skirmish. Additionally, the National Guard is also hot on Kong's tail as he scales the South Tower
tower, he finds flamethrowers pointed in his direction. Kong leaps to the North Tower and gives the soldiers a taste of their own medicine with a gasoline tank. Despite Prescott's plea for a capture-not-kill mission, the big guns roll in, helicopters armed to the teeth, aiming to take Kong down for good. Kong sets Duan down safely before facing the music. Duan tried to serve as the human shield to Kong, as she thought that the choppers might back off if Kong was holding her. But Kong steps up to take on the choppers alone. Kong knocks the helicopters out of the sky like flies, but the barrage of bullets proves too much. After a valiant fight, Kong takes a tumble from the tower. As Kong lies there, taking his last breaths, we see a chaotic NYC with reporters and onlookers swarming in. Duan is heartbroken and weeps as she tries to get close to Kong for one last moment. The big guy gets one final look at his lady love before breathing his last breaths. King Kong Lives, 1986. So we've all thought that Kong took the ultimate plunge off the World Trade Center back in 76. But no, he was actually in a coma at the Atlantic Institute. In fact, the poor guy was in this state for a solid decade. We meet Dr. Amy Franklin, who's on a mission to get Kong's ticker ticking again with a high-tech artificial heart. But there's a small hiccup. They need some of that rare Kong-type blood. Q, Hank Mitchell, our intrepid adventurer, who happened to stumble upon Lady Kong in the wilds of Borneo and pieces together a prehistoric puzzle that explains how these giant apes exist on different islands. They fly Lady Kong over so that she could donate her blood to Kong, and just like that, Kong was back in the game. But freedom calls, and soon, both Kongs smash their way out. This, of course, doesn't sit well with the army, led by the gung-ho Colonel Archie Nevitt, who's hell-bent on capturing or killing our giant lovebirds. They manage to corner the Kongs, and while Lady Kong gets captured, Kong sets on a mission to rescue his gal, even though his new heart was giving him a bit of trouble. Meanwhile, Dr. Franklin and Mitchell are on their own mission after finding out that Lady Kong is expecting. They bust her out to a cozy barn for some privacy. Just in the nick of time, Kong finds the military blockading his family reunion. Despite taking hits and his heart giving out, Kong goes all beast mode, takes out Nevit and saves the day. He makes it just far enough to see his mini-me before he finally dies. In the end, Lady Kong and her kid are sent to Borneo for a fresh start. King Kong 6 issue miniseries 1991 In 91, Monster Comics dropped a fairly awesome 6 issue King Kong comic series. What's interesting is that apart from the cover of the comic, everything else is in black and white, and you can thank the talented Don Simpson for it. Furthermore, this one was way more than just any Kong retelling. It had the green light from Marion C. Cooper's estate, which made it quite legit. Now, if you're thinking this is just the 1933 movie slapped onto paper, <laughs> no, this comic actually takes quite a bit of inspiration from the 1932 novelization by Delos W. Lovelace, and these are mixed with the original script to provide some fresh twists and perspectives, and even characters. If we're to talk about the differences, first off, the crew was sailing on the Vasta tour, not the Venture. There's no Charlie, the cook, and second mate Briggs. But hey, you get a few Doc Savage references. You know, the pulp superhero. But that's not all. This comic's packed with extra goodies, like the spider pit scene and more dino drama that never happened on the big screen. Plus, there's a newbie in town. I mean, uh, well, a new character, Wally, who was Denim's assistant. Now, she wasn't present in the movie, and not even any previous written work, which makes her a comic original. However, apart from these few differences, the comic more or less follows the same narrative path as the movie, so it's rather pointless to go through it again. The Mighty Kong, 1998. So, The Mighty Kong was yet an animated take on the King Kong saga, but more importantly, it was a musical. The story starts with director C.B. Denham, who ditches his animal show business to chase movie dreams. Once again, he bumps into Anne Darrow doing a bit of five-finger discount on an apple, and it doesn't take him long to figure out that she'd be the star of her movie. After a persuasive dinner, complete with a musical pitch, Anne hops aboard the Java Queen alongside a cabin boy named Ricky and his monkey, Chips. While on board, and second guesses her ambitions, but Ricky reminds her she has zilch to lose. The crew is loaded with more firepower than usual because, well, according to ship gossip, they're headed to some no man's land that's more than just waves and sand. Post this, we get the whole scene with the ritual and Anne's kidnapping, etc. Then there's some good old T-Rex action. Until now, the animated piece will provide you some chills, thrills, and of course, a dash of musical flair, all while revolving around Kong. Kong then whisks Anne off to his home inside a volcano, where he washes her under a waterfall before tossing her into a pool. Not your typical first date, but uh, then again, what can one expect from a gentle giant? Anyway, it's now that the Pteranodons and a giant snake attack, and Driscoll manages to rescue Anne. Of course, Kong is brought to NYC, he climbs the Empire State, and the whole shebang follows. However, unlike the original movie, this one shows him breathing after the fall. Kong 
the animated series TV 2000-2001. So, after King Kong falls off the Empire State, Dr. Lorna Jenkins decides to get all sci-fi with it and combines Kong's DNA with that of her grandson Jason, which gives us Kong 2.0. Some time passes by and some shady dudes crash into Dr. Jenkins' lab looking for these mystical primal stones. Of course, Hong and Jason were not about to let Grandma down, so they swoop in and send the bad guys away. Unfortunately though, one gets a little too acquainted with acid and starts a chemical barbecue. Realizing Kong has a target on his back, Dr. Jenkins moves the big guy to Kong Island. Years pass, Dr. Jenkins catches up with Jason for a reunion on Kong Island. Jason brings his buddy Tan, and their professor Ramon de la Porta tags along, but only after some email hacking. Needless to say, we're not on the side of Team Ramon. Anyway, they crash land and get chased by a T-Rex. Kong steps in and saves the day. They bump into Lua, the island native, and make their way to Dr. Jenkins' place, where Kong is none too pleased to see Ramon. Turns out, Ramon's been holding a grudge since the lab incident and wants the primal stones for himself. After a couple of transformations, Jason merges with Kong to form Mega Kong and knocks Ramon over a waterfall. But surprise, he survives. Ramon's obsession with the primal stones kicks off all sorts of chaos, leading to more mega battles. Amidst temple ruins and dramatic escapes, Jason and Kong have to get the primal stones before Ramon can unleash the ultimate evil monster, Chiros, from his island prison. So, yeah, it's really fascinating that with the Cyberlink, Jason can merge with Kong to give rise to a pretty unique superhero. King Kong 2005 In the 1933 NYC, with the Great Depression in full swing, Bordeville star Anne Darrow finds her stage dreams crumble when her theatre shuts down. When she's hitting rock bottom, director Carl Denham pitches the idea to sail off to some mystery island for his next film project. However, the executives aren't really in the mood to fund such an expensive project, but Denham's not the type to take no for an answer. He grabs his right-hand man, Preston, and scrambles to find a new leading lady after their existing heroine quits. We again meet Anne, who was trying to nick an apple where she meets Denim and you, well, you know the rest. Anne's on the fence until she hears Jack Driscoll's penning the script. Next thing you know, they're dodging the cops and setting sail on the venture, the ship that would take them to Skull Island. As the ship cuts through the ocean, Jack and Anne hit it off. But the rest of the crew turn sour when they realise Denim actually got them on a wild goose chase to Skull Island, just that the goose, in this case, were supposed to be legends and rumours of a place that's supposed to be terrible news. Eventually, they stumble upon Skull Island. It's not what they'd hoped for with ancient ruins and hostile natives making it clear that foreigners were not welcome. Things go south fast. It's only by the skin of their teeth and some firepower that they manage to get out of the first skirmish. In this high-stakes game of adventure and survival, Denim's dream of capturing the essence of Skull Island on film turns into a nightmare real quick. And that's just the beginning of the troubles. As things heat up, Engelhorn is all hands on deck to ditch extra weight and get the venture floating again. On the other hand, Jack realises that Anne is gone. You see, the natives had abducted her. Naturally, the men plan a rescue mission. The islanders drag Anne to a spot for Kong, the beast god, to take her away. The crew's timing is off. By the time they reached Ground Zero, Anne had already been taken away into the jungle by Kong. They trek into the wilderness, chasing the echoes of Anne's screams and a trail of chaos Kong's left in his wake. A surprised dinosaur stampede turns their rescue mission into a mad dash for survival, with everyone barely holding on to their dear lives. Meanwhile, Anne was trying to slip away from Kong, but you can only do so much against a gentle giant who's not so gentle right now. Her attempt to lighten the mood with some vaudeville buys her some time, but Kong's not amused for long. Back with the rescue squad, they were already having a shit time of their own, and Kong was only making their lives more difficult. Not very far away, Anne was dodging one prehistoric predator after another, until she came face to face with a T-Rex mama. Things had started to look grim for Anne, but Kong arrived just in time to save the day and his lady love. Jack's survival game kicks into overdrive at the bottom of a bug-infested pit. He scrambles to avoid becoming monster dinner. Jack then goes solo, determined to find Anne, while Denim talks Engelhorn into the plan of abducting Kong. Under the cloak of night, Jack sneaks into Kong's hideout and finds Anne sleeping in the giant's palm. But of course, Kong wasn't that dumb that he'd allow his most prized possession to tiptoe away. Thankfully for Anne and Jack, a swarm of flying pests buys the duo just enough time to make a break for it. Unfortunately though, Kong was hot on their trail. Preston dropped the bridge so Jack and Anne could book it to safety, which left Kong raging at the gates. Despite Anne's protests, the capture included regular Kong movie tropes like grappling hooks and chloroform. But if you know Kong, you'd also know that it's difficult to get him down easily. Seeing Anne being taken away lights a fire under him, and he busts free, chasing 
chasing them to the coast. Having said that, a well-timed harpoon and a dose of chloroform, courtesy of Carl, do the trick, and poor Kong found himself Broadway-bound builders Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. In New York, Jack and Anne have drifted apart, and Denham brought Kong on the big stage. And then come the camera flashes, Kong's escape, his great climb, and ultimately, his great fall. Kong, King of Skull Island, sequel to 2005 movie. In New York City in 1957, Vincent Denham stumbled upon a slice of his family's tumultuous past. You see, Vincent was the son of Carl Denham, the guy who had the bright idea to bring Kong to the Big Apple. Vincent was on a mission to find out what happened to Kong after his fall from the Empire State Building. He also wished to know what happened to the giant's body, not willing to believe the tale spun in dimly lit bars or whispered in the shadows of skyscrapers. Vincent contacted Jack Driscoll, who became his unlikely ally. Together, they set sail for Skull Island. Both men were driven by the need to unearth Kong's story as well as the desire to confront the ghosts of their past. The journey to Skull Island was anything but smooth sailing. The sea, as if guarding the island's secrets, stranded them on shallow waters. But Vincent was a man on a mission, and a little thing like being stuck wasn't going to stop him. He and a crew, including a translator for good measure, decided to take their chances on a smaller boat to reach the shore. However, Skull Island lived up to its fearsome reputation. A giant octopus attack later, Vincent found himself on Skull Island. Vincent's unexpected detour led him to a tribal hut, face to face with a woman known only as the Storyteller. She was the keeper of the island's lore, a bridge between the past and present. The island's tales were as wild as they come, and had everything from monstrous dinosaurs and tribal wars to colonists and Kong's ancestors working alongside humans. The Storyteller recounted a battle against Gore, a behemoth that threatened everything on Skull Island. It was Kong, the last of his line, who rose against Gore and became the King of Skull Island. But victory came at a cost. It was later revealed that Vincent's father brought the remains of Kong to Skull Island, where the king found his final resting place. Kong, King of Atlantis, 2005. In this animated giant monster film, Kong scales the Empire State Building, while New York gets an Atlantis-styled makeover. Let's just, uh, leave it at that. Turns out, it's all just a bad dream that Lua was having. She wakes up on Kong Island, relieved that Kong was still with them, but spooked by a prophecy of doom, especially when a real solar eclipse messes with an ancient sundial. Meanwhile, Jason and Tan were with Kong, while trying to save a baby cave bear from a tar pit. But when the tar pit kinda traps Jason, they realize they're in over their heads. Lua reveals that they need Kong, who sparks a bit of a tiff with the guys who can't figure out what's up. And as for Kong, well, he was kind of fed up with the drama and dips out. Later, it's revealed that Queen Reptilla of Atlantis had been watching everything through a drone, and she figured that Kong was, in fact, the key to bringing Atlantis back to the top. Her right-hand man, Lord Psychophis, tries to sweet-talk Kong into coming back as the lost king of Atlantis. I mean, Psychophis also promises him the world. Curiosity gets the better of Kong. He takes the bait. Lua also confirms that the first ever Kong was, in fact, the one time King of Atlantis who took one for the team. He sunk the place down in order to stop Queen Reptilla's plans of world domination. The clock was ticking with that sundial moving. It threatened to bring Atlantis and its baggage back to the surface. With no luck trying to stop the dial themselves, Jason and Tan realize they need Kong's muscle. They track him down, only to get sucked into a tar pit, whirlpool, and spat out into Atlantis. Interestingly, Kong was sitting on his new throne. Dude was enjoying all the royal treatment. But it all stops when he learns about some rebels who aren't too happy to see him teaming up with Queen Reptilla. Despite some confusion and a bit of a scuffle, Kong helps the Queen's forces defeat the rebels. However, the rebel leader ensures that Kong learns he's siding with the wrong team. Meanwhile, Jason, Lua, and Tan wake up in rebel territory where they meet Zayla. Although these young humans try to clear up the mess by saying that they were on Kong's side, the rebels are convinced Kong's gone rogue, which only means that even these guys were playing for the wrong team. Nevertheless, the dust around the Allegiance debate settles and everyone teams together to race to stop Kong from being crowned. You see, the crown that Reptilla was going to use had some mind-controlling crown tech. It would have rendered Kong little more than a puppet to Reptilla. Naturally, the rebels ambushed the coronation, and our gang tried to free other mind-controlled creatures, including a massive bear. Kong, caught between Reptilla's commands and Jason's pleas, decided to ditch the bad guys and fight alongside the rebels. When Reptilla's beefed-up dino guards proved too much for Kong, Jason steps in, and they merge into Mega Kong, laying waste to the opposition. The day saved. Reptilla's reign crumbles, and her own turn against her. Now go!
Kong, King of the Apes. In the year 2050, Kong was pretty much in the spotlight, but not for the right reasons. But then he had been tagged as public enemy number one after an incident at the Alcatraz Islands Nature Reserve. But as should be expected, Kong had been set up. The real villain was an evil genius with a thing for giant robot dinosaurs. This guy was planning to unleash chaos on the world. Kong was the only one who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these mechanical monsters. The lead characters after Kong were the Raimi twins, Lucas, the wildlife-loving good guy with a heart of gold, and Richard. The younger by a mere 20 minutes, but miles apart in terms of morality. Richard had a beef with nature and an unhealthy obsession with bionics. So much so that he turned himself into a Biono man. You see, Kong saved him from a fire when they were kids. A fire Richard started and then tried to pin on Kong. And yet, Richard has been holding a grudge against Kong. In his adulthood, Richard made it his mission to dominate Kong Island and turn public opinion against our furry friend. Kong and Lucas are forced into the life of fugitives while contending with Richard's evil plots. Kong Skull Island 2017. Now, for the biggest universe of the franchise, we get to explore Kong Skull Island in all its glory. Back in 44, Skull Island was totally off the radar until two fighter pilots, Hank Marlow from the US and Gunpei Ikari from Japan, crash land while trying to take each other out. But then, a giant ape shows up and they're like, uh, okay, maybe we've got bigger fish to fry. Almost three decades later in 73, the Vietnam War was winding down and Monarch was scrambling to get funding for a trip to Skull Island, which uh, we know is basically Monster Central. They managed to convince a senator with talks of untapped resources, which was a lucrative offer because of the whole Cold War competition. They managed to procure themselves a military escort led by a Vietnam-hardened Lieutenant Colonel Preston Packard. They also pick up James Conrad, Tough as Nails Tracker, and Mason Weaver, a photographer who had more than a hunch that there's more to this mission than meets the eye. After dodging this mega storm surrounding the island, they start dropping bombs to map the ground. Bad idea. Turns out, Kong's not a fan of explosions in his backyard. He makes his displeasure known by turning their helicopters into little more than piles of metal. Despite some return fire, Kong didn't budge. Post this skirmish, the survivors split into two groups. Packard wanted revenge on Kong for the loss he'd suffered, while Conrad and Weaver's crew were more about figuring out what the heck was going on. Fair perspective, as I'd say. However, everyone soon realized that in Skull Island, humanity was not at the top of the food chain. Packard plans to use what's left of their boom booms to take Kong down. Randa, who's been chasing monsters since one took out his ship in World War II, lets Packard and his men in on all the secrets and the lowdown. Despite Randa's, maybe we shouldn't poke the monster plea, Packard's got a one-track mind. Kong's going down, and he's the man to do it. Cut to Conrad and company stumbling into some human life and meeting Marlow, the same American pilot who's been living with the locals since World War II. Marlow learns that Kong is not just a giant ape. He's the island's guardian who keeps even nastier creatures, the skull crawlers, in check and at bay. Weaver notices a buffalo stuck under a chopper and wants to help comes in the form of Kong. Being the gentle giant, when not poked, he does the heavy lifting and frees the poor buffalo. Oh, and you should know that the Grey Fox, a Frankenstein's boat of wartime planes, is their ticket off the island. As the humans venture into Skullcrawler territory, Randa becomes lunch. As far as the humans are concerned, Packard was still hell-bent on taking down Kong, despite warnings from people like Marlow who believed that without Kong, Skull Island would be taken over by the Skullcrawlers, and that couldn't be good for any Anyone. So, Conrad pulls the peace-loving part of the crew back to their makeshift raft. Meanwhile, Packard was moving on with his plan to bathe Kong in a river of napalm. Conrad and Weaver shared a quiet moment with Kong and even touched the big guy's face, which was a big deal. However, the moment was cut short as Packard's fireworks grabbed Kong's attention. The team can't let Packard turn Kong into a bonfire and rushes to intervene. By now, Packard had Kong in a fire trap. Despite Kong's heroic effort, he hits the deck hard. Packard was about to go full villain on the downed monster guardian, but Conrad Conrad and his friends show up, guns drawn, begging Packard to stop with this madness. Even Slivko was siding with Team Kong now, but Packard's mind had already reached Crazy Town and was ready to blow it all up when the Skull Devil appeared from nowhere like a daisy from hell. Kong gets back in the game but struggles against Skull Devil. Just when you think it's game over, Kong's human pals pitch in, Brooks opened fire with a machine gun, Weaver used a flare gun. Kong uses the window of opportunity and, in what can only be described as a moment of beastly brilliance, Kong goes fishing inside the Skull Devil's throat and yanks the victory right out of it.
Skull Island, the birth of Kong comic. In 2012, the Aussie Navy stumbles upon a monic package floating in the ocean. Soon enough, Houston Brooks, who was about to get retired, instead gets a surprise visit from Singh with a recorder from Brooks's son. Popping the tape in, Brooks hears Aaron's voice from the past. The contents of the tape included heated arguments they had about Skull Island and Kong. Flashback to 95. Aaron was all riled up about Skull Island's secrets and Kong's babysitting job. Despite his dad's attempts to explain the sacrifices made to keep the island under wraps, Aaron leaves. And Houston is seen calling after him. Aaron's monarch squad then reaches Skull Island, where they expect to check out a Muto fossil, but instead end up encountering a flock of psycho vultures. Of course, they escape from their osprey, minus the pilot. En route to the crash site, they get ambushed by death jackals and even lose one of their own before Kong steps in like a bus. He saves the day by squashing the jackals. While patching up and pondering over Kong's heroics, they meet the Iwi, the island's natives. A young Iwi kid, Ato, dubs them Awati, or Sky People. Naturally, this gives Aaron and the crew a whole new perspective on where they've landed. Aaron Brooks and his monarch friends get the VIP treatment in the Iwi village, with Rikio toasting the herbal brews. Ato, the Iwi kid, who speaks English thanks to Hank Marlowe, schools Aaron on the importance of their massive wall. Some of you may know it's a skull crawler blocker. Rikio gets visions and history lessons from the Iwi brew and tells Aaron and Evelyn the deep lore about Skull Island's past. He even claims that they're part of a prophecy as people from the sky. He speaks about the ancient battles between Kong's ancestors and skull crawlers. Meanwhile, the team prepares for a pilgrimage to meet Kong. The science guys in the team were skeptical about this, but they still prep for a journey to see if Kong was really the protector of this monster infested paradise, or just another monster whom people worship out of fear. Come morning, they were all painted up for the pilgrimage. They arrive at a ship graveyard, and Rikio's visions go into overdrive. He freaks out over Skull Island mysticism. Suddenly, a siren jaw attacks, but it also leads to the discovery of some old monarch weapons. On the other hand, Kong roared in the distance, which only meant that he was gonna take down the siren jaw. Brooks and the team arm up. After Kong takes down a siren jaw, Aaron, Brooks, and the gang try to escape as soon as possible, because now, every creature in the vicinity was gonna come to take a bite at the human snack. They dodge psycho vultures and death jackals, only to stumble into a swamp locust's turf out of nowhere. Brooks gets a call from Cejudo, their pilot, who's miraculously not only alive, but has their ride somewhat ready to go. The plan is to meet up and leave Skull Island ASAP. Interestingly, their path to freedom leads through a graveyard of Kong's ancestors. They spot a juvenile skull crawler and rush into a cave to avoid becoming its lunch. Inside, Rikio has a vision of Kong's tragic past. You see, Kong is an orphan who's on Skull Island to avenge his parents. In the end, Kong defends the humans, and Aaron sees Kong not as a monster, but as a guardian fighting for those he protects. Having survived the ordeal and witnessed Kong's true nature, Aaron decides to stay on Skull Island to help the Iwi rebuild their village, which had recently been destroyed. Kingdom Kong comic. In 2019, Monarch's G-team pilots, including Audrey Burns and her friend Tam Nassar, were gearing up for a mission named Operation Carlsbad. By 2021, Audrey was flying over Skull Island with a new team and prepping for a mission into Hollow Earth. Colonel Edwards and Houston Brooks filled them in on the plan to explore a newly discovered entrance to Hollow Earth, which happened to be right under Skull Island. The team is briefed on the dangers and the importance of navigating through the gravitational inversion boundary to reach this uncharted territory, with Kong being a significant concern. Meanwhile, Brooks was also dealing with a monster storm that had been brewing since Godzilla's foe, Monster Zero, was awakened. This storm, with super speed winds, was heading straight for Skull Island and threatened everything in its path, including Kong. Audrey struggles with past traumas from a mission gone wrong, haunted by memories and the pressure to perform under the weight of her guilt and grief. As Audrey faces her fears and uncertainties, Brooks contemplates the complex relationship between Kong, Skull Island, and the broader Titan ecosystem. Brooks pieces together a puzzle on Skull Island and manages to form a link between seismic activity and a megastorm to a deep-sea creature called the King of the Deep. He feels the heat from the higher-ups to kickstart a drilling operation to explore the Hollow Earth entrance discovered under the island. Despite his worries that Kong might be throwing the island's balance off, he greenlights the drone to scope out the drill site. Meanwhile, pilots, including Audrey Burns, prepare for their dive into the Hollow Earth. As they push forward with the plans, Kong stumbles upon a cave with ancestral paintings that scream about a prehistoric titan fight. However, a scream from the depths halts everything in its tracks. Now, this scream totally freaks out Audrey mid-simulation and leaves Brooks questioning if they've awoken something sinister. The crew rallies together, but before they can process anything, the island starts to tremble. Soon enough, they realize that the comms are down, which in turn leaves everyone on edge as Kong faces off against the elements and possibly new titan threats. You see, in this moment, Kong was standing as the island's last line of defense. Anyway, Kong bumps into Kamazuts 
a bat-like titan that hates sunlight. Soon enough, Brooks and his team realize that they have accidentally invited trouble by linking the storm and earthquakes to the vortex's disturbance. Interestingly, Audrey had had the experience of battling Kamazots, so the humans distract the bat titan and its minions while Kong gets down and dirty too. Despite the high stakes, Audrey and her team manage to blind Kamazots with a sonic boom which allows Kong to finish the job. Godzilla vs. Kong 2021 Five years post the Ghidorah chaos, Kong was under a giant monarch dome on Skull Island which is now all stormy and cut off from the rest of the world because Monarch didn't want Godzilla and Kong to come in contact with each other. You see, both the Titans considered themselves kings, and a fight between these two forces couldn't be good for anyone. Anyway, by now, Kong has got a special bond with Gia, the last of the Iwi folks, who's also the adopted kid of Kong expert Eileen Andrews. Gia, who's deaf, and Kong chat through sign language, which came as a shocker to just about everyone. Apex's big boss, Walter Simmons, talks to Nathan Lind, a former Monarch scientist with Hollow Earth expertise to have Kong show them the path to Hollow Earth via an Antarctic gateway. They load Kong, who's out like a light and all tied up onto a barge with a military escort. Godzilla senses Kong's presence in the open waters and comes to fight Kong. If you've watched the movie, you'd know that Round 1 went to Godzilla. Kong is then flown to Hollow's Earth door and they all dive in, following Kong in the HEAVs. In Hollow Earth, Kong feels at home. He finds his ancestor's old weapon, including an axe powered by Godzilla's dorsal spine. But when the Apex people beam the energy signature back to Hong Kong, Godzilla laser drills a hole straight to where Kong was at. An Apex vehicle gets squashed by Kong in the chaos. Kong, Andrews, Jia and Lin then appear in Hong Kong, which leads to Kong and Godzilla's final fight, with Godzilla standing tall at the end, leaving Kong down for the count. As Mecha Godzilla now Ghidorah driven starts tearing everything apart, Lind jump starts Kong's heart with a HEAV explosion and Gia gets Kong to team up with Godzilla. The duo almost gets wrecked until Josh fries Mechagodzilla's controls with Bernie's booze, which gives Godzilla and Kong the edge. Godzilla powers up Kong's axe, allowing Kong to dismantle Godzilla. In the aftermath, we find that Monarch has set up shop in Hollow Earth, with Kong ruling his new kingdom like a boss. Kong The Great War comic. Now, this one is an ongoing comic at the time when this video was produced, so we don't have the full story yet, but here's what we do know. So, after waking up on Skull Island with his submarine and crew wreck, an Imperial German Navy captain finds himself in a bit of a pickle. Skull Island isn't exactly a tropical vacation spot, especially when you're greeted by a massive tentacled reptile. Despite the initial shock, the crew manages to bring the creature down. Of course, it became clear to everyone that it was time to move to higher ground. They'd only begun to find some respite in a cave when they realized they were not alone. Kong was in the vicinity, and his presence made it clear this island had its own rules. Pushing forward, the captain leads his crew away from the beach and aims for a distant mountain that seems like a safer bet. Skull Island TV 2023. So, between the disco and grunge eras, Kong made a buddy, a local island gal. Their friendship started with Kong saving her from a skull crawler using his DIY tree spear. You know what? I just loved that scene from Godzilla vs. Kong. Such beautifully done graphics. Anyway, back to the story. Kong even gave her a lift to a mountain, where she schooled him on a machine and stuff. One day, they ran into some chameleons. Kong, being Kong, didn't wait for a heads up and jumped into the fray. He got nicked, but still won, only to get a verbal spat from his human pal, calling him a stupid animal. Hurt, Kong left with his hawk friend to nurse his wounds in the sea and accidentally woke up some giant sea beast. Kong brought a fruit-laden tree to the village, but the island girl was still upset. She kinda tells him to take a day off. The next thing you know, Kong here screams, rushes back, and finds the place wrecked and the folks gone, and it was all the work of the sea monster. He discovers his friend is badly hurt and takes her to his place, but she doesn't make it. A few years later, unlucky teens Charlie and Mike end up on Skull Island. Kong saves them from some aggressive crabs and does his usual patrol thing. Charlie ends up up in Kong's temple and spots Kong all sad while staring at a necklace. Annie and Charlie hatch a plan to use the necklace to draw out Kong. They manage to tick Kong off and lead him to the sea, where the Kraken ambushes him. It was a rough fight, with Kong nearly drowning, but he managed to jab the shipwreck into the Kraken's head and get some air. However, the Kraken comes back for more, only to get torn in two by Kong. So yeah, he avenges his late friend. Monarch Legacy of Monsters TV 2023-2024 Now, Kong has only a brief appearance in the show, so there's really nothing much to talk about here. However, we do get to see more of Kong in the next entry, a DC and Monsterverse crossover.
Justice League vs. Godzilla vs. Kong comic. Alright, so Kong lands in the DC Universe because of the bad guys, especially Toy Man. Gorilla Grodd, who's totally fanboying over Kong, arrives on Skull Island. By the time we reach issue 3, Kong was already fighting a war bat and then almost annihilates Green Arrow until Supergirl swoops in. She lands a few on Kong's mug, looking to save her bud, but then both her and Kong are kinda like, uh, why are we even fighting? They share a moment, locking eyes and realizing neither's keen on fighting the other. Now, this is an ongoing comic, and I don't wish to delve too much into the story in this video, but you can check out our videos on individual Justice League vs Godzilla vs Kong issues. Godzilla X Kong The New Empire 2024 Lastly, we've got Godzilla X Kong, the latest instalment of the franchise. It's become abundantly clear that Kong and Godzilla are gonna fight tooth and nail, but uh, not against each other. This time, they're gonna collab together to fight some of the nastiest of destroyer titans, including the Scar King. We're going all guns blazing on MonsterVerse video, so uh, if you're a fan, I suggest you stick around with us. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.